All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, whether you're online or here in person, we're so glad that you are here and that we get to worship with you. Uh, if you're new to us, my name is Jim Chung, and I'm the associate pastor here, and I'd just like to share with you a little bit about our church. Uh, our mission here is to introduce people to Jesus and to help those who know Jesus to become more like him, and our vision is to carry out that mission by following Jesus through worship, nurture, and outreach. If you'd like to learn more about our church and the different ministries that we have here, please check out our website, which you can find at scbcmd.org. Uh, to help you navigate the service today, please visit our Watch Live page, where you'll find the order of worship, the scripture passage for today, and sermon notes as well. Uh, in trying to keep everyone safe during the pandemic, we do not have a designated time of giving during the service. However, if you'd like to worship through giving and you're here in person, there is an offering box right outside the sanctuary. And if you'd prefer to give online, uh, we invite you to go to our Give page, which outlines all the different ways that you can do that. Uh, we'll be honoring our graduates in June, so if you or a loved one graduated this past fall or will be graduating this spring, please let me know. We want to include middle schoolers who are being promoted to high school as well. Uh, also, men, if you're interested in singing a couple of songs on Father's Day from the stage, <clears throat> please email me and let me know. This is for all men, uh, old men, middle men, young men. These are not my words. I'm quoting uh, somebody else. Uh, Middle, older ones can bring their sons and grandsons. Uh, it isn't just fathers. We'll sing two very familiar hymns, uh, only one rehearsal, and that's going to be at 9 a.m. on the morning of Father's Day on the stage. Uh, and I've been told to encourage you not to wait to the last minute uh, because we need to get a head count. So uh, if you think that you might do this, uh, please go ahead and let me know. Uh, through email. That'd be great. Uh, we're also looking to start up our children's ministry sometime this summer. Uh, so if you're interested in helping with that, please get in touch with me about that as well. And if you're in the building this morning, we kindly ask you to continue to maintain distancing from one another, uh, wear your mask, covering nose and mouth at all times. Beginning next week, uh, in keeping with the ruling of our state and local leadership, social distancing and wearing masks will no longer be required in the morning worship service. <laughs> okay, so on that note, let's go ahead and stand and greet one another in the love of Christ. <clears throat> if you're watching online, please drop us a chop, a chat or a comment so that we can greet you too. Thanks so much.
Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, for our time together this morning in worship of you, we give you thanks, Lord. And as we sing out your praises, let it be a sweet, sweet song to your ears. As we give, let us give with great joy at the work you will do in and through South Columbia. And as we pray for missions, give us a heart for those who do not know you, who are far from you. Let us pray for and find ways to serve these people. And as we receive your word through Pastor Steve, help us to understand and live it out in a manner worthy of your gospel. We thank you, Father, for your love, your grace, and your presence here. And Father, out of overflowing grateful hearts, let us worship you this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated for a moment. Our reading for this morning is Ezekiel chapter 2. <clears throat> and I think there are a couple of very interesting things about it. Number one, Ezekiel receives this message right after his glorious vision along the banks of the river in Babylon. Number two, he gives us a glimpse of the power of the Holy Spirit to effect change in this, the dimension that we know and are familiar with. And number three, I find his position very interesting coming right after the book of Lamentations in our canon. So this is Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spear came to, into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid through briars and thorns are all around you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament, and mourning, and woe. Please join me in prayer. Father, this morning we thank you for the many, many good things uh, that have come to us to allow us to be here in this place at this time. Father, we thank you for the, the wonderful gift of life itself as we experience it now, and we'll experience it according to your promise. Father, we would pray that uh, for this little while that you would be with Pastor Steve as he unravels some of these mysterious words and brings to us the lesson you have laid upon his heart. Father, we thank you for this and all things. In Jesus' name, amen.
One of the things I appreciate about when our young people lead us in worship is that they choose all their own music. And, uh, and it may have been unfamiliar to many of you <laughs> today, some of it, I hope it wasn't, but I'm always impressed with the text. And so that, that's an encouraging thing that here's our, uh, some of our future worship leaders uh, and they do a really, really good job and I appreciate them ministering to us this morning. So, so I hope I don't get in trouble. I had a couple ladies say they, they got all fixed up this morning, had uh, makeup and lipstick and was excited about not wearing masks and uh, here we are wearing masks with last Sunday. So uh, can I encourage you to go ahead and be ready for next week and we'll, t- and we'll take a look. So uh, anyway. <laughs> We are planning uh, right now to leave the sides uh, marked off so that if you're here and you're still uncomfortable, with so, uh, you'll have an area where you can sit as well, but I'm looking forward to that. So this morning, um, as we go to the Lord, we're, we're going to uh, pray together, but I also want to take a moment this morning and pray for uh, some of our missionaries. And so I'm going to ask if you'll take your Bible, open to Ezekiel chapter 1, and uh, join me in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you that there is only one king who would humble himself and take on the form of a servant. And Lord, being the Bible says, being found in the fashions of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the cross. And Lord, the scripture reminds us that because of Jesus' willingness to give his life for ours, to be our sacrifice and our substitute, that you have highly exalted him And given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of things in heaven and things on the earth, things under the earth. And that one day every tongue will declare him Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you give to us through trusting him. And we thank you for this gospel message which is able to change people's lives. And Father, this morning as we come to your word, we ask that you would give us understanding and insight. But Lord, this morning we also remember those who minister the Word of God in many different contexts, and especially, Father, those of our missionaries. Father, I pray for all of our Southern Baptist missionaries, for those who are on foreign fields today, and for those who are in North America, and we pray, Lord, for them and for their ministries that they would be aware of your presence in a very powerful and real way, that, Lord, you would give them endurance and encouragement, that, Lord, you would allow them to see fruit of their labor, that they would be faithful in ministering your word, and, Lord, cling to the promise that it will not return void. Father, we pray for some of those missionaries from our own church family. I pray for Melody Warford this morning and for her work with the Pioneer Bible Translator. We thank you for how you've gifted her and, Lord, for the work that she does in the field of of media. And we pray for Melody today for a a blessing upon her life and for, Lord, a fruitful ministry. We pray, Father, for Dave and Lindsay Batt, who are Bats who are ministering through crew on the college campus. And, Lord, we pray that you would continue to grant them grace and wisdom, especially, Lord, in a difficult year like this year has been. And we pray, Father, that you would open up doors of opportunity for them to share the gospel with college-age young people. Father, we pray for Derek Thompson and for his ministry of abolition men. Lord, for trying to change the hearts of men, for educating, and Lord, for helping battle this human trafficking, sin, a blight that is in not only our country but in the world. And so we pray for Derek, and pray, Lord, for that ministry. We also remember this morning Gerard Washington and the Christian Jail Ministry in Howard County. And we thank you, Lord, for the lives that have been changed through the work of this ministry. And we pray for Gerard today and for your blessing upon his life. Uh, Give him wisdom as he continues to lead. Lord, we pray today for Jerry Steele uh, as he ministers through God's trucking ministry. And Lord, even as we're worshiping this morning, We know that there is a a service going on up the road in Jessup where truckers are being ministered to with the word of God. And so we pray for your blessing on that. Lord, we pray for all of those in our church family who are serving you and ministering to you. And Lord, we also pray for us as a church that you would open up mission opportunities for us. 
Lord, maybe that would take us to a foreign country. Maybe it would take us right next door. Lord, we pray that you would open up doors of opportunity for us where we can have gospel conversations with people, where we can tell them about Jesus. And Lord, help us to be ready, to be prepared, to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Lord, we thank you for uh, that moment in our lives where you opened up our heart to understand and receive the gospel. And so we pray that today for many people. Lord, we thank you this morning for your love. And now again, as we come to the scripture, we ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we introduced a new series called Exploring Ezekiel. And we met Ezekiel, a young man who had been deported from his home in Jerusalem to Babylon by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. With others, he lived in exile in a Jewish colony on the banks of the Kabar River. And there he had a very powerful and awesome vision of the glory of God, which left him on his face, prostrated in the dirt because of God's majesty. Now, this vision, as Bruce pointed out, was actually the beginning of Ezekiel's call as a prophet of God. Let me remind you that there's indication that Ezekiel, who's called a priest in the first chapter, may have been preparing for the priesthood. And if indeed he is around 30 years old at the time of this book, uh, or at least the time of this vision, then he would is right on the verge of entering into the priesthood. And so there's a sense where uh, his entire life is uprooted and the very thing that he was preparing for was over before it began. Now this morning we're going to consider the second chapter, which really centers on God's call. And if you're wondering if we're going to go chapter by chapter, the answer is no. But I think this morning, this one deserves a careful look. So I want you to to look with me at a few things this morning. The first one is in the first couple verses, and that is Ezekiel was commissioned by God. On his face, he heard a voice speaking to him. Then he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the spirit entered me. And, I, and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Now, I'm sure you guys know this, but in, in the books of the Bible, originally there were no chapter and verse divisions. So in the original scroll or script of Ezekiel, we shouldn't overlook the fact that this prophetic work comes as a result of this overwhelming vision of God that he has. I think it's a really significant observation because Ezekiel's call to ministry as a prophet is not something he had prepared for. It wasn't even something that he had wanted to do. Maybe he didn't even know that it was coming. I find it interesting how many times in the Bible that God called or commissioned an individual to do a specific work or purpose. For example, when God was ready to release or free the Hebrew people out of Egyptian bondage, he commissioned an 80-year-old shepherd to be the one to lead them. Do you remember this passage? Then the Lord said, this is to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel have come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you can bring my people out of the sons of Israel. Uh, out of the uh, sons of Israel out of Egypt. I absolutely love this passage. Did you pick up on the subtle shift of pronouns? God says, I have surely seen, I have, in- give- I have given heed, I am aware, I have come down, I have seen, therefore, I will send you. Now Moses seems to have been okay with God's plan of deliverance as long it was God who was doing the delivering. But somehow the I changed to you 
And Moses was not quite as receptive. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Now this, by the way, was the first of several objections that Moses gave as an excuse as to why he was not the one to lead the Hebrew people out of bondage. But I want to remind you something. This is God's call to Moses. There's another uh, situation in the Bible where God comes to an unsuspecting Gideon and says, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to them, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Let's move into the New Testament, where God appears to a Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus, whom he not only saves, but then describes as a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And there are many other examples, and it just occurred to me, when God wants something done, why does he come to an individual and not a committee? Maybe there's something we should learn. Does God still call people today? There's an old story about a young man who grew up on a farm, but he decided that God wanted him to go into ministry, so he quit farming, and he went to seminary, where he failed miserably. He returned home discouraged and dejected, and he went to get counsel from his pastor, who asked, why do you believe that God called you to be a preacher? And the man said, because one night I had a dream, and I saw the letters P.C., appear in flames of fire across the sky, and I knew that must mean preach Christ. And the pastor who had known this young man his entire life said, Son, PC didn't mean preach Christ. It meant plant corn. Now, I would imagine that many, if not most, people who go into ministry would tell you that they experienced a call to ministry. Now, I know that this is a very subjective and personal claim. But I remember as a newly committed believer sitting in a home Bible study, kind of minding my own business, when these words flashed across my brain. I want you in ministry. I have to tell you, going in ministry was not anywhere on my spiritual radar at all. But a few short months later, I find my, found myself in Bible college. But even there, I could not have initially articulated to you what God specifically wanted me to do or where he wanted me to do it. But eventually, God led me into pastoral ministry. Listen, God doesn't call everyone to be a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary into full-time Christian ministry. But every child of God is called. Now, here's some familiar verses. And we know that God calls us all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Did you catch the fact that there's at least a couple times in those verses that God says that he calls us? In his prayer for the Ephesian believers, Paul prayed that they would know what is the hope of his calling. There is a sense where God calls every believer and realizing that we are not our own, but that we are bought with a price and that we are to glorify God in everything that we do which means the way we live our lives should reflect that calling is really a significant thing. You see, the essential question then becomes, it's not what do I want for my life, but what does God want for my life? Now, I know that we're at that time of year where young people are graduating from high school and college, and the logical question is, well, what are you going to do next? Some of them may be certain, uh, some of them not so sure, 
some have already made their choice and are mapping out a, a future career path, and some are just saying, I just want to enjoy the summer. I'm not saying that planning for the future is wrong. But if our young people who know Jesus, shouldn't they be encouraged to seek first God's will? To have a sense that the vocation that they choose in life is something that has to do with God's purpose in their life? How about you? You know, Do you have that sense this morning that where I am and what I'm doing is God's call upon my life? See, I would guess that most of us, in fact, if any of us, have never experienced such a dramatic and frightening calling and commissioning like Ezekiel did. But living with the sense that we're doing what God wants us to do, that he indeed has commissioned us as well, is an assurance that we would do well to pursue. Ezekiel explains, then he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. God addresses Ezekiel as the son of man and tells him to stand up. Something I did not know, but it's interesting that God in this entire book never addresses Ezekiel by name. But he does call him 93 times son of man, which may be a way of just emphasizing Ezekiel's humanity before God. Uh, maybe it's tr- the, uh, the attempt to stress the difference between human beings from God. What I think is noteworthy is that Jesus used this same term to describe himself, not because he was separate from God, he is God, but an, a way to emphasize the reality of what we call his incarnation or the fact that he became man. God, Jesus Christ, was perfect God and perfect man at the same time. The Son of God and the Son of Man. And it seems to be our our Lord's favorite way of describing himself. It appears in the Gospels over 80 times, and yet no one else addresses him by this title. Nor do any of the Gospel writers refer to him by it. This title was also understood, at least among some Jews, as the name of the Messianic ruler of the new kingdom be established. Ezekiel goes on, and he spoke to me, in the, and, and as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Not only did the Spirit put Ezekiel upright, but he entered him. Now, we're not going to take the time this morning to get into a deep discussion of the Holy Spirit's presence and working before he came to permanently indwell believers which occurs in the second chapter of Acts in the New Testament. See, one of the great blessings as a believer in Jesus Christ today is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We often uh, talk about having Jesus in our heart or asking Jesus in our heart. And I, I hope you understand we're speaking figuratively. I mean, if, if they rushed you over to the hospital and an x-ray technician took an x-ray of your heart, they're not going to see a little tiny Jesus. And when I'm explaining that to kids, they look at me like your seminary education didn't really accomplish much for you at all, did it? (laughs) We're talking about the presence of God permanently living inside of us. In fact, the cool thing is the fact that the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in our lives is God's guarantee, his promise, that one day he's going to complete this process called salvation which has not only a past aspect where we're forgiven for our sin, a present aspect where we are being delivered from the power of sin in our lives, and a future aspect where one day we're going to be in the presence of God and won't be in the presence of sin anymore. So if you ever hear someone talking about salvation being a process, that's what they mean. They're not meaning that you can become a Christian and lose your salvation. No, salvation is the work of God and The proof that God is at work in somebody's life is he gives them the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that every Christian has the Holy Spirit. But when you come to the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon people. And he would come upon them to empower them for service or a special ministry. But not necessarily would he remain with them. And while it appears that there are people in the Old Testament who enjoyed a continual filling or indwelling, there was no promise or guarantee that God's Spirit would stay with someone. For example, in a psalm of repentance, 
after being confronted with his sin with Bathsheba, King David pleaded, hide your face from my sin and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Now listen to this. And do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. In Ezekiel's call, he experiences the presence of God's Spirit coming upon him or coming in him. And did you notice the sequence? First, God told Ezekiel to stand. And then he himself provides the enablement to stand by the power of his Spirit. You know, God's commands always include his enablement to carry out the command. It is something that's really important to remember that God's work is first and foremost a spiritual work. That was true for Ezekiel's ministry as a prophet. That's true for the ministry of God's people today. And I would say it's something that's especially true for the church. We need to remember that the church's work, if it's God's work, is first and foremost a spiritual work. Almost 60 years ago, A.W. Tozer wrote this. If the Holy Spirit were withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been drawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would have stopped and everybody would have known the difference. If Tozer was correct in his day, 60 years ago, I wonder what it says about the current state of the church today. I'm reminded of the scripture from Zechariah. Not by might, nor by pow- not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If God has called you to do a certain thing, he'll give you the power to do it. The best position that you can come to is to recognize that you and I aren't able to do what God wants us to do in our own strength. That's where we learn to trust him and rest him. Ezekiel was commissioned by God, and then Ezekiel was called to a people of God. Look at verses 3. Then he said to me, Son of man, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord. Ezekiel is sent to the children of Israel. Now, if he began his ministry, as some suggested, around 593 B.C., there still would have been about seven years before the fall of Jerusalem, and Israel would have ceased as an independent nation. So as Ezekiel begins his ministry, there's still something of a kingdom in Judah. The temple is still there, though many were scattered around through the Middle East. They were forced into exile by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But Ezekiel's word was for all of them, for those who were in exile and for those who were still in their native land. And you would think, wouldn't you, that God's people, especially those who had been forced into captivity and deported, would have been receptive to Ezekiel's message, that they would have wanted to know what God had to say to them? But then again, Judah had witnessed the captivity of the northern kingdom over a hundred years earlier because of her idolatry and spiritual adultery and didn't learn a thing from her sister's downfall. You know, the prevailing attitude may have been one of false security, either denying that captivity was coming or that the Jews would actually be safe in Jerusalem. But God describes this people as rebellious and stubborn and obstinate children Rebellion is more than resistance. The Hebrew word carries the meaning of being bold and audacious in acts of rebellion. It's a a, a flagrant disobedience. It's an emphasis on blatant disloyalty. The nation isn't sneaking around trying to hide and disguise its sin, but was an open defiance thumbing its nose at God. They're also described as stubborn and obstinate. Interesting two words that are connected with parts of the body. The face and the heart. I guess you could say that these people were stone-faced and hard-hearted. The people to whom Ezekiel was prophesying were selfish, with little regard for the word of God. And even though they heard God's word, it made no difference in the behavior. 
They were motivated by a fixed, stubborn self-will that dismissed God as being irrelevant. You talk about a difficult ministry. It's not uncommon, uh, if not normal, that when someone begins a new work or a new ministry or starts a project, plants a church or goes on the mission field, they do so with some sense of hope and optimism. Usually we start with a positive outlook, even if it might be someone naive, and it's only after that we've taken some knocks and had some disappointments or experienced some failures that optimism might begin to wane. Most church planters that I know start with a kind of set-the-world-on-fire attitude. And it's only the reality that ministry can be a lot harder than they thought, that setting on the world on fire seems a little more challenging than anticipated. But Ezekiel was told from the beginning that he is going to be sent to a people who are not going to listen to his message. So then why even go? Why even bother? Look at verse 3. As for them... Whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. The point is that for Ezekiel, this is a matter of obedience. It doesn't matter how difficult or how unresponsive the people are because his ministry is concerned with the message, not the results. Can I say that again? His ministry is concerned with the message, not the results. Think about that for a second. It reminds me of, of a story that I've shared before about a, a man who was asleep in his cabin one night when suddenly the room was filled with light and the Lord appeared to the man and told him that he had a work for him to do. The Lord showed this man a large rock in front of his cabin and explained that he wanted this man to push against that rock with all of his might. So this man did, day after day, and week after week, and month after month. In fact, for many years, he worked from sun up to sundown, trying to move that rock with his shoulders set squarely against its cold, massive surface. He pushed with all of his might, and each day he would come back to his cabin, sore, worn out, feeling like his whole day had been spent in vain because he hadn't budged the rock one inch. Seeing that this man was showing signs of discouragement, uh, the evil one decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into the man's mind. You've been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't budged. Why are you killing yourself over this? You're never going to move it. And succumbing to the evil one's accusation that the task was impossible and that he was a failure, he was discouraged and disheartened. And he said to himself, yeah, why should I really kill myself over this? I'll just put in some time giving the minimum effort and that should be good enough. But he decided instead to make this a matter of prayer. And he went to the Lord with his troubled thoughts. Lord, I have labored long and hard in your service putting all my strength in doing that which you ask me to do. Yet after all this time, I've not budged that rock by a half a millimeter. What's wrong? Why am I failing? And the Lord responded compassionately, My friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against that rock with all of your strength, which you have done. Never once did I mention that I expected you to move it. The task was to push. And now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you have failed. But is it really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your back is muscular. Your hands are calloused from constant pressure. And your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition, you have grown much. And your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. Yet, you haven't moved the rock. But your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my, in my wisdom. And this you have done. So now, my son... I will move the rock. Ezekiel's call was a matter of obedience. And so is ours. Sometimes God 
leads us into a ministry, calls us into a task, directs us into a purpose, and it's hard. And we don't see the results, and we want to give up. But remember, it's God's call, not yours. And, and your responsibility is just to be obedient to what God has called you to do. But there's another issue, and it's a matter of witness. Because regardless of the response, God is sending Ezekiel so that Ezekiel will know that a prophet has been among them. Being a messenger, he was not ultimately responsible for how the message was delivered, only to demonstrate that the prophet had been among them. If Ezekiel did demonstrate that he was a prophet of God and that a prophet of God was truly among them, and if he did that with God's word, then the results are up to God. Ezekiel was commissioned by God. He was called to a people of God. One other thought, Ezekiel was charged with the message of God. Look at verse 6. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence for their rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I'm going to give you. I, I know sometimes when we hear the word prophecy, we usually think of something that involves telling the future. And certainly there is an element of prophecy that is um, uh, foretelling, but prophecy primarily is forthtelling. It's to communicate God's word. Prophets were primarily messengers of God. And by the way, a critical issue in the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet was to have been truly commissioned by God. Perhaps the most serious charge that could have been levied against a prophet was that God hadn't sent you. In addition to being sent by God, a, a prophet had to be accurate. Do you know that a true prophet of God's accuracy rate was 100%? But even accuracy itself was not enough to verify a true prophet. Let me read to you something, a few verses from Deuteronomy. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he has spoken to you, saying, Let's go after other gods which you have known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice. Serve him. Cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God has commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Notice that in this passage, there is an emphasis, a contrast with, between either listening to the voice of a prophet or listening to the commandments of God. For Ezekiel, the imagery of proclaiming God's word is being given something to eat. So in verse 9, he says, Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. Ezekiel is given a scroll to digest. Scrolls were papyrus or leather sheets specially prepared for writing. They were sewn or glued together, inscribed, and then rolled. This was kind of the standard form for books prior to the beginning of the second century. Now, I don't want to press the imagery of eating too far, but, but I believe that the symbolism and the significance has to do with the personal reception of God's word and the internalization of it. God's message was to become a part of himself. The psalmist wrote, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. How sweet are your words to my taste, 
yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Ezekiel was to assimilate the message and proclaim its contents. And I couldn't help but think that what Ezekiel needed to do is what every person who's responsible for teaching God's word has to do. The only message that we have that has the power to change a person's life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Messengers of God's word cannot pick and choose what they want to communicate. But they are, as the Apostle Paul said, responsible for declaring the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God, whether it's something easy or whether it's something hard. So look at verse 10. And when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. As Ezekiel begins his prophetic ministry, God's, as God's messenger, the initial message is not going to be one that's easy for people to hear. Because on this scroll were written lamentations, mourning, and woe. And you don't even have to look up what those words mean to know they're not good. There is no good news, bad news here. It is all bad news. Now, the good news, the message of hope will come, but it's not until the latter part of the book. One commentator observed the emphasis in the New Testament is upon the love and grace of God. Today, we don't talk much about God's holiness and wrath. It is because of the wrath of God that we need the grace of God. The tendency in the church today is to give the good news and minimize the bad news. The fact is that the good news is only good in the context of the bad news. In our efforts to be consumer friendly, many pulpits refrain from preaching the wrath of God lest they frighten away the seekers. And the tragic result is that we have produced a milk toast gospel and a soft Christianity that talks mainly about the promises of God without mentioning our need of commitment to God. The result is that God has been lowered to the level of a cosmic vending machine. Notice that this scroll is written on both sides, something that was seldom done. And there are many interpretations as to why the scroll is written on two sides. But I think a plausible explanation is that God had a lot to say that he wanted Ezekiel to communicate to Israel. You see, this challenge set before Ezekiel is a formidable one indeed. Someone wrote, there is no other book in the whole Bible that presents the sins of God's people in as much detail as the book of Ezekiel. Do you want to get the full picture of the sinfulness of man? Do you want to get the full picture of the hopeless situation of man? Do you want to get the full picture of the awesome character of God and his holiness? Do you want to get the full picture of the wrath of God? Then study the book of Ezekiel, and your life will be transformed. Ezekiel was commissioned by God. Ezekiel was called to the people of God. Ezekiel was charged with the message of God. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we do stand in awe of the scripture. And Lord, as we continue to uh, explore our way through this book, I ask that you would give us understanding and insight, uh, truth that we can apply to our own lives. Lord, this morning, we, uh, we thank you for, uh, for calling Ezekiel. And Lord, as we're going to see, what he had to do was not easy. And yet, Lord, we see your majesty and your power and your grace demonstrated in his life. Lord, we see a, a, a man who commits himself to you to accomplish your purpose. And, Lord, I guess that's what I would pray for us this morning is that we would also be willing to heed your call in our lives. That, Lord, that each day we would make that decision to live for you, regardless, Father, of where that takes us and what that means for us. That Lord, we'd have that same sense that we are right where you want us to be. I thank you for your love. And Father, as we come to the end of this gathering this morning, as we think about our own relationship with you, I pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to respond to you. That Lord, whatever it might, you might be saying to us today, that we'd be obedient in listening to your voice. 
Father, if there are those here today who are watching who have never made that decision to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, then I pray that today would be the day, this would be the time, where they would be willing to repent of their sin and be willing to accept the gift of God's salvation and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and experience the blessing of what it means to be a child of God. Lord, as as we continue to worship, we pray for grace in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to, uh, in just a second, we're going to stand and our young people are going to lead us in a closing song. And this morning I would extend an invitation to you that if you need to talk to someone about a spiritual need in your life, if you have never made that decision to trust Christ as your Savior and you would like to talk to someone about what that means, then as we're singing, I'll be down here at the front and uh, just slip out of your seat and join me and we'll, we'll find someone who will spend some time explaining to you how you can know for certain that Jesus is your Savior. Maybe there is another spiritual need in your life. Maybe there's another decision that you want to share publicly. And if that be the case, we encourage you to come. So let's stand. And if you're watching at home, if you have a spiritual need, please communicate that through us right now, and we'll respond as soon as we can. Let's stand together. claim this morning indeed how great you are thank you for loving us thank you father for your many blessings thank you for life this day thank you father for uh, offering to us this wonderful gift of salvation through faith in jesus christ thank you lord for making us your children thank you for this opportunity today where we join with others to to lift up your name and to to declare indeed how great that you are. Thank you, Lord, for the purpose and the significance that you have for each and every one of us. And as we leave this morning, Lord, make us aware throughout this week of your presence in a very powerful and real way. 
Lord, may we find reason to give you thanks. And we pray, Lord, you would make us sensitive to the opportunities that may arise to have gospel conversations with people that we might, Lord, also share with them. Lord, we give you praise, and we do so in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning, and uh, we'll see you next week.